mm-hmm. talking bollocks interview take one so basically patrons this is that that was all the shit that nobody else is going to get to hear okay just paul and i talking shit um <laughs> so uh welcome welcome back to the podcast my dear friend my brother from another mother it is paul podcast not well a waller of the year in horror podcast and patreon bloody hell hello hi what an intro <laughs> i know that's you by the way <laughs> love it well thanks mate appreciate that uh, that's yeah. all right I, I thought it was quite apt that we were talking um one day after the 35th anniversary of um the fear which is um for those of you that don't know acid rains uh first full-length album i can still i still consider it our second album certainly our second release anyway um yeah bizarre right i mean i i, I mentioned this because obviously yeah well not obviously but paul you you are an acid rain fan um uh, did, did was the fear one of your one of yours or were you like you know moshkin steining out oh look at that eh? there we go but for listeners um uh, paul's <laughs> just pulled up his top to reveal um an acid rain obnoxious tattoo right across his chest <laughs> <laughs> t-shirt really uh... um, so we, yeah we, was was the fear uh I, I, i'm starting by interviewing you about me what a twat no i like um, it yeah, I tell you yeah. what, I got a weird experience with it. Like, we bought it. So me and my mate, Chris Press, we would buy, like, any releases that were m- even remotely thrash-related in our price. Um, knew this one was coming out because there was a, a, I think, a half-page advert in Kerrang! or something like that. Uh, full-page, cheeky was it? All right, sorry. <laughs> okay. Honestly. Um yeah, so, so we knew it was coming out, and like, but we don't know what's going to turn up from week to week. We didn't know we could order stuff in or anything like that. And it was yeah. amongst a, a load that we would buy, and then we'd tape one that we had bought for the other one and vice versa. So that's how we would deal with it. But it was always like, with this one, it was a, a bit scary to put it on because we both loved Moschkenstein so much, uh, and we didn't want it to not be as good or is instant and it wasn't as instant like the songs are really complex and like you have to listen to it a few times before they hit there was a few hooks that got you straight away but not many it was like much more like involved to listen um so yeah over the months yeah we loved it but straight away it was it was a little bit of a disappointment i must admit because it was Uh, just like wow what is going on here yeah, I mean, I, but I get that because really, on first listen, there's humanoia and life informs to hold on to, and everything else is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to need to listen to that a few times before I know yeah. if a I like it or b if it's any good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, also a lot of songs like with uh, with what was going on at the time, we were so into mini albums, like, and there were so yeah. many of them in the fresh scene, and like just to sit down with a with a whole album, um, but. I remember like Moshkenstein being on like a flip with Survive or something like that. Or what was their mini mini one? Um, it, no, was it, it was on. Um, it was on. It would have been on Speed. Game Kills. Over. I think that's what it was. So there was Game Over by Nuclear Assault. I think that was a mini. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. That was a full album. What was um, the mini they did? Possessed had a mini out. Um, oh, did they? No, I'm talking shit. Um, Reanimator had a mini, Deny the Reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that. Um, it was definitely Nuclear Assault. Oh, the plague. the plague. There we go. Instantly together, Bosch. So, yeah, we had that one side, and then because it was one of those stupid short, like, cassettes, and yeah. then Acid Rain the other side, so we would like, flip, 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 and that's the best way as you're going to, like, school or to whatever just yeah. to learn things back to front. And of course, with a full album and we've actually got it, like that's a lot of a different process. Like that's yeah. a weekend day. You're putting it on, you're listening, you're sitting back, you're reading Stephen King novels whilst it's playing and things like that. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's weird when you say it's that amount of time that's gone between like yeah. when you put it out and then, because like I imagine also things just seem like yesterday, like when they were happening. Um. Yes, yes, kind of and kind of not. I mean, um, you know, 
it was it's so long ago to a certain extent some of it just seems like they're somebody else's memories you know that it's it's that long ago uh but some of it is also really you know really clear and hd and like it was yesterday it's 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 very very strange um rummaging through my brain is like rummaging through a a box of photos from 1989 and some are blurred and got stickers on saying this couldn't be developed and and others are just like moments in time that are beautifully captured yeah. that seem like yesterday and yeah it's um it's it's really odd and the thing is i i i i keep occasionally i'll remember something about those times and i decide whether it should go into my secret history of thrash show um or not as i remember these like odds and ends and um yeah it's it, it's weird uh, to be honest i haven't done i haven't been doing a sort of oh it's 35 years and i sit down and think about it um and also you know because we're working on a new album it it it's there's no chance of a 35th anniversary tour or gig or anything like that because we need to be away from everything. We need to be off the scene. You know, we're only doing three shows this year so far. And um, that has to be the case because if we're looking at putting a new album out next year, we're going to be doing a massive sure. tour and you have to go away before you can come back. <laughs> you know, because, yeah. uh, you know, we, we can't do a, we can't do a fear 35th anniversary tour this year. And then, turn around to the same promoters within 12 months and go, and we've got a new album coming out and you've got to book us again and you've got to pay us more. Despite the fact we were here a year or less than a year ago, that's not going to work. Yeah. So, it's not going to fly. No. So you've got, you know, it's that, it's that whole self-imposed thing. And it's, this brings us around nicely to, to you and, and, you know, Oms calling it a day and, and you, you know, being out of music now, having been in it all that time. And I know you mentioned several times that you just, you know, you couldn't wait for it to be over. <laughs> um, how does it feel? You, you know, is, is it, is you, you know, is, are you just glad to be out? Yeah, I am. It's not particularly the band, like when, uh, for anything, when you're actually on the stage, like that's fantastic. Like, singing in front of people like feeding your ego and also like just having that bit of artistic stuff and being in the studio like creating the art they're amazing times but everything and i mean every single other thing like just really dampens it for me from that like even i think even if i wasn't like taking a managerial role i would still hate all the stuff the driving the uh the the actual process of like just making sure everything was right my voice was okay this and that and it was such a drag i really didn't yeah. like it when i loved doing this so why sort of take away what i really love doing uh so i can feed like a my ego in the other way like i don't know and i do believe that it is really like a, an, an ego thing as well like and i don't oh, yeah. I don't miss that because I've got this. So I've still got the way that I can be artistic with this. Um, yeah. And it's doing stuff that I'd want to listen to myself, which is, which it was with the band as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get that as well because it's like, you know, instead of being, you know, Paul from Oms, it's, it's Paul from a year in horror. It, it, there, there is, there is, there's an, there's an identity there. And I mean that, you know, I mean that quite seriously. Because when you've when you've been part of something and you're known as somebody that is attached to something, to to walk away from that is is huge. Whereas if you're walking away from it to something else, that's that's different. Yeah, I don't know if like if I didn't have this, um, whether I would feel the same. But I haven't missed it at all or anything like that. Um, not in any way. And that last show was full of people that listened to the podcast and to the the chagrin of the uh, of the rest of the band, whereas we're on the merch desk, all of us celebrating our last show. And then like people are coming up talking to me about horror and things like that. It was brilliant. I loved it. Like, what can I say? Yeah, it was great. I, I, but there's a classic example of 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 
one of the things you refer to as well about like everything else that goes with it is the fact that you're in that position. You've got people coming up talking to you about horror. It's the last ever gig and nobody in the band should give a shit, but they do. And they see you there being like people asking you about horror and each one of them has got a different thought press going on. Some are like, who cares? And some are like, yeah, like it's people like you that are responsible for this not happening anymore because, you know, because Paul's going off to be with you instead of us. And there's other people like they they should be asking about the band. And it, it's it, it's all of that that you're yeah. not going to miss as well. Uh, totally. My, they, I, I love those guys. We've been to dinner and stuff since like as friends um, yeah. and we're going to be doing it again. Um, but yeah, as I say, that whole music business stuff, uh, it, it got me, I wouldn't say down. It's just like, if you're thinking a couple of years in advance, Oh, we're going to be doing a last show. That's good. Then, you know, you're in it for the wrong reasons, aren't you? And it was yeah. purely because we, we didn't owe our label a record, but we, made a promise um i'm not going to let anyone down uh, yeah. and that promise with we'll finish this you've already invested in it we'll we'll put it out and we'll tour it and we did that and then we said goodbye and and that was it so yeah it was that thing of i don't want to let anybody down even though i don't particularly want to be here as i say as soon as you're on stage you do want to be there so you're not being fake and and i think people can see straight through it like when you are being fake like and that would hurt like to do something that you're not proud of. So yeah, I've left yeah. on a pretty good one. And like that last show being damnation in front of all them people and the one before, which was even busier, which was arc tangent. And like we headlined one of the side stages, but it was just so rammed. I think Devin Townsend was on the other stage and there's like no one walking around. It was just like you were either was watching us or you were watching Devin and that was it. And um, it was just like, um, I don't know, like an apocalyptic moment in a film where there's just smoke around, there's people crowd surfing, like our bass player was up in the rafters at one point hanging upside down. Like it was just an insane mental show. And it's those things you dream of when you start a band. Like imagine if we could play in front of 3,000 people. Like that's insane to me. And, you know, it's just one of those magic things that happen so yeah i'm happy with it i take it h that this is um the conversation you were talking about <laughs> about like a, yeah. a regular interview thing yeah yeah um because it's kind of like you know i Sneaky. i haven't in i like it i haven't interviewed anybody you know probably in the history of talking bollocks where they've they've walked you know plenty of people have walked away and come back and that's when i'm interviewing them yeah as opposed to somebody who is genuinely walked away, that is it. I'm off to do this now. That's the end of the band. You know, it's yeah. it's done. Goodbye. Um, and I, and you know, I'm interested by that. And I thought that people listening to a music podcast who, you know, listen to bands all the time, you know talking about how passionate they are about being in a band and their music and everything else. It'd be interesting to speak to somebody um, that I know is going to be open and honest and is going to be the opposite of that. That's going to be, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. You know, uh, I don't have that passion anymore. Uh, do you, do you think, because for those that don't know, you were also involved in the music business and you were managing not just your band, but other bands as well. Yeah. Um, excuse me, folks. I'm just, uh, getting ready here um do you think that um that that took your enthusiasm away as well like working with um other bands in the same sort of uh, uh you know in the same capacity that you were for oms no like that's interesting because that was exciting like and i loved doing the sort of from scratch like thing i mean that's one of the most exciting times in a band if you know that yeah. you've got something and you're good um i guess all bands would think that wouldn't they at the most localist of levels but like sometimes being as old and as music wise i guess as i am i know if there is something that little something that that could like be 
maybe even like a gimmick or whatever, but like that, that would sell to people and you've got a chance here to break through little by little. And I yeah. loved that discovery and I liked being first there. And because we would tour like the bands that would support us, most of them, no, 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 no. But some of them every now and again, you're like, there is a real bit of magic there. That was great. That was really exciting. And yeah, if I could help them any way that I could, then I would. So the, the level to what Ohms would get to, which is really not big at all, I can definitely get you there. But after that, it was always like, you want someone like, uh, you want to end up on like Spine Farm or something. I will yeah. get you as far as that deal is now on the table. But after that, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm not yeah. experienced. And if I was honest with them like that, and I always was, like, I think that's the best. If I can get you to go up those places, I've got enough contacts to get you, you know, to be playing a festival in front of 3,000 people. And yeah. when you're playing a local pub in front of 12 people that don't care, like, that's that's wrong if you're that good, you know? So you just need yeah. someone to step in. Most of the time, like, a, a band will have one person in that band that can do it. Sometimes not. So, yeah, yeah, if they didn't, I could jump in. No, I, I, I absolutely know. I mean, there's there's one particular band that I um that I speak to quite a lot, and they they ask me for their advice. They they don't have a member who who can take the lead or 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 has a concept of marketing or or business or anything. It, it's it's some guys in a room. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it, it it's I've ended up you know doing various bits and pieces for them. And it, it's kind of like it's times like that where you think, you know, wow, it like if you if in a band like that, just like where do you go? How do you even, you know, how do you, how do you, you just, you could be the best band in the world, but yeah, you know, no one's going to hear yeah. of you or from you unless you happen to do a gig in front of somebody. Or obviously now you've got, you know, you've got social media and you've got a, a digital footprint whereby people can find you and discover you. But, you know, we, it's yeah, it's it's tough. It's it's really tough. It, let's face it. Even if you've got a label and you put an album out, it's fucking tough. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And like, it can be disheartening. Like for for Ohms, we were the most successful on our third release, and since then it went down and then leveled out. Um, but we just didn't jump on all the opportunities that we we got because we couldn't. We all work yeah. except one of us. So. Like yeah. we got offered a three week American tour, which would then lead to a seven week American tour. Oh, um, man. We couldn't do it. And it was supporting big, decent bands. Um, I think the first yeah. one was with Crowbar. Uh, yeah. And then the second one was whoever was going to be available at that point sort of thing. But um, yeah. like to not do them. And then we had a, a, a five day tour of India. Like, and we would, like wow. yeah exactly and it's like right well this is why we've got in the band to do like these weird things yeah. that we would never be able to do and straight away we were like i'm scared i don't know anything about touring india like everyone was like mm, i'd rather do that american thing and we can't do that yeah. so let's just not do it got put back on the back burner and then it never happened so yeah. you know it's all these opportunities that you like wish you'd take i mean we would have got a decent documentary out of doing a five gig tour of india i guess at the very minimum but yeah yeah it's like all them opportunities that you can't do making videos is another thing like we yeah. invested more money in two videos than we did our whole recording career yeah um, uh, to which now one of them was lost and one of them was never finished because of covid so yeah, it's just one of that. It's a hard yeah. drive incident. I don't want to talk about. Uh, but, Fair enough. <laughs> but but <laughs> that's one of those things. I mean, and and it's really good because I, I think this is like for people listening, just listening to all of that. That the it's the chip chip away effect because initially you hear, yeah, I've walked away from band, walked away from music, playing in front of three thousand people. You know, and and uh, you know, a part of someone's going to hear that and go, "Yeah, you know, what a dick!" You've just like, you know, there's people out there that would give yeah. their right arm to be doing that. But then, you then hear this litany of oppor missed opportunities, opportunities that you weren't able to take up, and and things, and it starts building that picture of, 
yeah these it's it, it's that it's that drip drip effect and there does become a point i know i've been there there's there, there does come a point where you get offered something and it's not until you're offered it that you realize you can't do it the realization that you can't do it makes you wonder well why am i doing this at all yeah and it's like i've been offered a dream yeah and it's always been a dream and now it's a reality I've realized I can't do it. So what are my fucking dreams? Why why am I here? What's going on? It's, it's, it was frustrating. And there was a point where I could have been, it could have been me and Chaney, then the rest of the band would have had to be in a new band and we would have just gone to America and seen if we can do it. Uh, but the whole point of being in that band was that group of friends and yeah. it just didn't seem right. I know it's a cliche of one can't do it, we're not doing it. And that was never really the way with us. But uh, to, to get rid of three other members, your your core sound, that's yeah. crazy. There's there's no point. Yeah. Well, um, you hear, yeah, because you hear you do hear bands very often now saying like, oh, so and so is stepping in. You know, just about every band you can think of has had somebody step in for them at some point. Um, oh, you know, they, they've blah, but but not three members. I mean, that's like. Yeah, you know. Mm. Yeah, you, you also you can't go on tour with three brand new members and like two dates in, you realize you've got you've hired three cunts. <laughs> well, they they realize they've joined two cunts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very good point. Very good point. <laughs> yeah, too right. Like there, there's just so many opportunities, and I'll tell you what, there is a couple of bands that we were that were supporting us. Uh, at that stage when we were at our biggest that did take them opportunities um, and they quickly flew over us in popularity like Conjurer is one um, yeah. a, a different style of band but like they were soon signed to I think they're on Nuclear Blast now or something like that I don't know it's some big label I think it might have been Century Media for a bit and then they chose Nuclear Blast I don't know for sure but like it was like they took that month long tour in America. Right. And then they took the next step. Like they they went out to do one gig in front of uh, the yeah. the label head, you know, and and they just were willing to do it. Another one employed to serve. Like they're on Spine Farm. Um yeah. and like they we were on the on our very first tour when we had one EP out. Like we were playing above them. And again, it's that that same thing that what they would do is they would just like okay, this opportunity just seems really difficult. The drummer can't do it. They would sack that drummer, new drummer in, um, and away they would go and they would do that tour. And like, yeah. if you do want to make it in this business, and by make it, I'm not talking about money. Like, forget no, that. No, you're talking about being able to do that US tour. Yeah. If you, if, yeah. If you want to be, you know, selling those records, you can do a tour and you can actually make your money back like you know break even or maybe even like bring home a grand or so then yeah. you've just got to be willing to put your mouth you, you know your mouth where your money is your money where your mouth is i don't know what the saying is but you've got to yeah. like give up that job and um yeah i just couldn't do it yeah i, I love yeah, I, my job i, I mean I, am i wrong in thinking that the bands that you've mentioned were also younger than you guys yeah i well younger than me uh that's where i would yeah. say that i'm like the oldest of the lot like right i i am two years away from 50 so yeah it's not it's not long and like i don't want to be uh 50 and i told the band when we started i don't want to be 50 and like playing in front of like 150 people at black heart sold out again you know like that is like and as you said earlier what an arsehole like if you can do that what's your problem but like yeah. The the issue is I don't want to be that guy at fifty. When I watch yeah. someone that's been trying to make it, uh, and you know they're they're in their fifties, they're overweight, you yeah. know, you know, it's like uh, we're still rocking yeah. on. It makes me cringe a little bit. Like we haven't got like, for instance, what you've got is like this solid back catalog to to fall on, um, and like a fan base. Uh, and that presence you had in magazines and at that time, which will allow you to to go on and, and create new stuff. But also you've got that old stuff as your, you know, your grounding. Mm. Yeah, we don't have that. We're, we're just a new band. And when all of a sudden, well, actually, we're eight years old, nine years old. 
and we're still still doing this in the in the grind and I'm coming up to 50 I'm just not into that I'm not into it yeah. at all yeah. and and I do you know what neither I I wouldn't be either I can I can say that without a doubt um you know I mean you know back in the day I recognize that band that you're talking about like right you can't do it right get rid of the drummer and let's let's do the tour I I recognize that um ambition you know I, yeah. I i recognize that desire and 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 you know that's understandable to me um of a younger band because you know it's like right sorry drummer but there's four or five people in the band and like this is we want this to be our career and you're either in or you're out and it's yeah. it's put up or shut up time. And that person goes, do you know what, guys? Then in that case, I'm out. Right, okay, thanks for letting us know. We've got to get a new drummer because we're off to do this, you know? And and I absolutely get that. That's happened a million times with a million bands. But when you're that much, when, when you're a bit older, it, it, it yeah, you have that discussion of, yeah, we can't do India, we can't do the States. And, you know, it, it's... It's it's understandable, but you're also at a, you're also at an age and a level where you go well. Even if we do this tour in the states, even if we do this tour of India, it's not going to fucking change our lives. <laughs> we're going to come back and have some bills to pay, and if we're lucky, we might have a few quid to pay them with. But it's like you know, we're, we're not that band that it, right. You know, we're going to go and do that US and India thing, and then we're going to go back again in two or three months. Then we're going to go back again. It's like no, that's not. It's not possible. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you've got to be able to do. It's not just about doing this US tour and this Indian tour. It's about, no, you do those and then you go back again and then you go back again and you go back again as your North American booker now says, right, okay, you've done East Coast. Let's do West Coast. Right, you've done yeah. that. Let's do this. Let's do that. I can put you out with so-and-so. I can put you out with so-and-so. And that's all work and all building towards a career. But you're not at that stage. You're coming towards... You know, you're way past the middle. You're coming towards the end. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I, I often wonder, like, with bands now, like, if they're getting into the pages, be it digital or what there is left of, like, um, print press, but if they're in the pages now, is that the same as the 80s where, like, you know, if, if you were releasing albums and regularly in the late 80s or early 90s, then you're career would you still be happening now for bands like Conjura or for bands like employed to serve both that have had front covers of Kerrang that used to guarantee you like okay yeah. you're you're good you're set for 25 years whatever you want to do you know um you'll be able to make some sort of living from it but in 25 years is that still going to be there for them it's it's so different like the where we are in the music industry and it's you have to have either a very nice mummy and daddy sort of thing like money on tap that you can yeah. actually invest into your career or just give everything up and like hope for the best. And yeah. like a lot of bands that do do it, like when you, when you hit those bigger bands, like they still are renting. Like I was so surprised like to hear what you haven't bought a house, like in the interviews that I've done, and they're renting and like they play, do a tour and they know they've got the rent for the next six months. Like that's yeah. crazy. What a way to live, man. That's mad. So what, what if you, if COVID happens, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to rent? Like, it's, oh. dude, you're talking, you're talking to a 53 year old man who is still renting. Right. You know, it, it, mad. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the thing is that, I, I I don't know. It's a, it's a separate discussion about the obsession with owning a property here. Whereas, like you know, many countries in in Europe, for instance, it's, it's like you know, why would you buy? That's mad. That's insane. Yeah. You know, it, it's it, it's all of that, and you know, whatever. But um, I but you know, I understand the principle. You know, either way, it is. If we do this tour, we hope to come home with this, and that you know, that means I can live for another six months. And yeah. then, but again, this is why it's younger bands who can do this because less responsibility enables you to do stuff like that. You know, um, it's when you have responsibilities further on in life where you're like, you know, none of us can do this because we're all going to get sacked. 
Yeah, man. I mean, this sounds really negative, but it's not because I think at the moment, like with music, like the, the creative side of things, I still, every single Friday, I wait up until midnight. I listen to as many new albums that come out at midnight uh, as possible, thanks to Spotify and, and Apple Music or whatever. Like, yeah, I, I know. I don't, I don't give a shit, man. I'm so into music still. Like, yeah. I can't. I can't help myself. So oh, now that's not... that's awesome, though, because I was I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I can't. I can't stop. Like I'm excited about this Friday. You know what's coming out this Friday? I find out what's coming out like about half an hour before. I write my little list out, and then at midnight, I'm straight on Spotify and having to listen to the individual tracks. What album should I download? Which one should I buy? You know, I I'm obsessed with it in that way. The art side of things. I love it's like all the the day to day of being in a band. It's, it's too much for me. Anyway, too much for me. And I used to think, well, if it's too much for you, then you know you don't deserve it. And fair, I think that's fair. Have you um have you heard Kerry King's new song? Yeah, yeah, I have. And like you said earlier, like, oh, it's interesting to get that perspective. Um, but imagine like you get an interview with Tom Araya. What's he going to be like? Because he left because he wanted to leave. He wanted to leave for a long time, yeah. uh, but he's leaving Slayer. Like he's not leaving Ohms. He's leaving Slayer. What an interview that will be. Whoever gets that, what? Now I, you're talking. I, yeah. I, well, I, funnily enough, you've brilliantly sidestepped what you think of Kerry King's new um, new song. So clearly you're trying very... to get him on a year in horror. No, I, I got offered Kerry King and yeah, the, what? yeah, I turned it down. I'm not into Kerry King. You massive cunt. I'm not into Kerry King in any way as a you person. Should pa- you should have passed over the details, mate. You should have said <laughs> no from me, but I know who might be interested. I can send you a link, Howard. Fuck All right, me, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I've I I thought about it because I thought, oh man, it's Slayer. I fucking love Slayer. But Kerry King as a person and what he said and like what he represents and all that. I was like, I just uh, don't know. I um, I genuinely think, sorry to cut across you on. there, mate. I think Kerry King, I think Kerry King's lack of giving a shit as to how he is perceived has led to an incorrect perception of who he is. Because Tom Araya, in his views, is further to the right than Kerry King. And Kerry King has admitted that he said some dumb stuff in the past. And I think we all know kind of what that was about, you know, faggot sure. comments made in the past. Yeah. But we're not all those people. We're not all the people that we were 20 years ago. Yeah. Someone played stuff to me. I said 20 years ago, I'm sure I'd be cringing. Yeah. And that's not yeah. me anymore. And he, he, when Dave Lombardo quit, Kerry King happily took the shit from everybody. But if you actually look into that whole scenario, um, basically Lombardo um, tried to pull a, if you're going to Australia, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to pay me more or I'm not coming. He basically ambushed the band. Tom was like, fuck that guy. I've wanted him out. I didn't really want him back. And Kerry King was like, I'm a bit gutted because I thought I was going to be on stage with Dave till I died. But he's gone and fucked us. And then he released a statement when he knew Tom and Kerry were in the air on their way to Australia to do the gigs without him, playing the victim. And the reason he did it all, which is available in court documents, his ex-wife will testify that he was struggling to maintain alimony, pay, alimony payments and he was developing a strategy to increase his earnings, which was ambush his bandmates and try and increase his, his stake in the band. And it blew up in his face. And Kerry King just has never, ever gone out there until the most recent interview has, has basically never said like, you know, hey, why is everybody having a go at me? You know, it is like, but it, it, and... Uh, yeah, so to that extent, oh God, I've I've mounted this li- big long defence of Kerry hey, King. You've not I? said allegedly yet, so I'm I'm going for this. 
Uh, well, all, all of that is available. The, the whole the court documents and everything. I know this because of D, DX Ferris's excellent books and also Talking Slayer, the podcast. Um, it, it, it's it's all deeply researched. It's there if you want to go look. Um, nobody ever has, but it's all there in court documents um, that are public. And um, yeah, it's um, it, it, so. Anyway, long story short, I, I think I think. Kerry King doesn't doesn't give a shit. And so hence is perceived by quite a lot of people completely wrongly. But he doesn't give a shit. He's got he's got no interest in setting any record straight. So, I, you know, I've got to respect that. And I've also got to get those details off you because, yeah, <laughs> it, uh, well, it would I did, be good. I did ask the PR to like to interview the singer. because they in Deaf Angel? Um, Marcus Agueda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, well, I'm not the person to talk to. This is about Kerry King. Piss yeah. Off. Mark is, uh, Mark's a top man. If you want to, if you want to speak to Mark, I can set you up. Nice. Yeah. I'd love to. Uh, but <laughs> so, that was my response to, do you want to interview Kerry King? I was like, <laughs> no, but what about the singer? <laughs> uh, well, honestly, you should have asked. I, Mark, Mark is somebody I would call a friend in the industry. And um, uh, I've had him on the show a couple of times and, you know, he's great. He's just, he's just a top bloke. He really is. But um, there you go. I got, uh, mate, I've interviewed Dave Lombardo and it scratched, I it scratched my Slayer itch. Um, you know, it's now the big one is to, to speak with someone in Metallica. Um, I wanted Newstead, but I feel like, <sighs> You've done that, damn yeah. it! Uh, and like I've, the only other angle I could even think of, no, nah, I don't even want to think. I, I just can't. I just don't. I think it's out of my. It's, well, if 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 it's for a year in horror, it's got to be Kirk. There's no chance. Absolutely no chance. Podcasts that deal with horror way bigger than mine have right. tried and been denied. Right. So yeah, yeah. it's got to be something that he is into. And then he'll reach out. You know, yeah, but do you know where? Do you know what the the angle that you've got that other people haven't? And you know, I play on this all the time. Is that is that you've fronted a band that you've worked with in the industry, um, which may which is a completely different approach because all of a sudden he's talking to you as peer to peer, as an artist, and as a horror enthusiast slash aficionado so i i actually think you've got a a compelling case to kind of stand out from the crowd i think i've got a contact but i think it's with the label um and it's yeah. someone that works for their label like that blackened thing i don't even yeah. know if blackened is still a thing yes it is yeah. yeah yeah uh so it might be worth a reach but i think there you is, go well, we, just we, remember, listeners, if you see Kirk Hammett turn up, yeah, on Paul's <laughs> podcast, it was virtually my doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and when you get the Howard interview, Kerry King, uh, you know exactly how that happened now. Yeah, and when Paul go. gets Marcos Aguada. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I don't know what I was going to say now. Yeah, best probably probably best not to say. Also, allegedly, I'm going to say allegedly. If okay, I said yeah, just anything. chuck it in there a few times. So <laughs> I'm interested. Okay, I don't remember, and maybe because it's all of three years ago, but I don't remember, or maybe I do. But um, a year in horror, the podcast. I think you pinged me a message and said, "Oh, this is something I'm going to be. I'm doing now." Um, are you, are you a are you a like a horror movie fan? And I've I must have said this story many times to you and to everyone else. And I was like, no, not really. I, well, it turns out I am, and I don't know why I didn't think I was. Yeah. Because like every month you'd send me a list of movies and go, you know, you're interested in talking about any of these. And I'd look down the list and go, it's like I've seen them all apart from like one or two. It's like I, I think I might be a horror fan. And you made me realize as well that I'm a Nick Cage fan as well. And yeah. um so how did the concept of a year in horror come together? Because I think it's, I like, I genuinely think it's a brilliant concept. There is so many horror podcasts out there that are doing something. And it's so easy to just go, I'll review some old films. I'll review some new films. 
I'll get the odd person on and chat to them. But you've created a um, a world slash a community that that has so many different branches to it. It's got interviews with musicians, which are clearly dressed up as interviews with musicians about horror films. The last one I listened to was a, was like a 30 minute interview and I timed it. 18 minutes were on his band. <laughs> 12 minutes we're on oh yeah that film's all right isn't it anyway yeah. nice to talk to you um we, so <laughs> love i love that. that i love that i love that but you've you but you've 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 managed to cover off so much but the core concept of going deep in on one year is is genius because it, it, it appeals to the horror fan because they go right this guy's like this is something different and then when they see the amount of content that you put out and the amount of work that goes behind that, if horror fans love anything, it's somebody who's potentially even more geeky than they are. It's somebody or as as geeky as they are. You know, I think A Year in Horror is the kind of podcast that so many of your listeners would listen to and go, I wish I'd had this idea. I wish I because this is like. This is absolute total geekery. You know, the guy's done four and a half, po uh, four and a half hours of podcasts on horror films from 1965. What the fuck? I can't believe I've listened to it all, you know. And, and I think it's become, it's essential listening for anybody into horror movies who's really into horror movies. Um, and you've just covered everything off the top tens, the the worst movies, the best movies. You've got splinters off for sci-fi corner and all sorts. And and you're done with like, you know, average arseholes in bands like me now. You know, you've got people like Dave Lombardo coming on. You've got <laughs> directors. Um, and when some of these interviews are happening, you know, you're you know, you've interviewed Neil Marshall a couple of times now, dog soldiers, etc. For those of you who don't know. Um, and it's clear that the level of respect is two way, mate. And I'm sure I'm sure you may not have realized this. But as a listener, I'm listening and I'm going like this is two people talking on the level. This is not a director like talking to a fan. This is a director going this guy probably knows more about my movies than I am. I need to have my shit nailed down. I need to know you know, I, I, I can't be slack in this interview. So yeah. it, it's A, thank you. B, it's wonderful to be involved with. Still am. All of you sign up to Patreon, mine or Paul's, and you'll be able to listen to our show that we do together monthly, which is called A Year in Bollocks, um, which is about a couple of horror things that we've suggested to each other. Um, where did the concept come from, mate? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Like, it's great to hear some something like that. I do receive emails where people say sort of similar things, and I still pinch myself when I get them. Um, but yeah, it was purely because that that was what I wanted to hear. Just like when we started Ohms, I wanted to hear a band that was uh, doing songs as long as Genesis in their like proggy world, but then sort of sounded like Swans, but no one was doing that. And then, except swans, as it turns out, uh, and then, and then I wanted to inject some like political stuff with crass. So I just thought, no one's doing that. Let's do that with us. And then with this, I really was into a few podcasts. There was an American one. There was a UK one, um, Evolution of Horror, like the real big one. And it was like, I love what they're doing, but. I would love to, I've got all this gaps. I don't know this film. What is that that you're yeah. talking about? Um, so it was just like, right, well, let's do it year by year. And just thinking, well, hang on, you can't do that. There's a million films that come out each year. So I had to go choose a, like, uh, a website called Letterboxd. And it was just like, right, if they've rated it three or above, they're the ones that I'll cover. Because with horror, that means a ton of horrors aren't going to get included. Yeah. Um, so that seemed like an easy out, but I don't know, just doing it year by year. That's the best way to, to fill in my horror knowledge. Cause it was all about me learning. I just wanted to learn cause I love this stuff so much. And then when I figured it out, like a few months before it went live for the first episode, I was like, shit, this is like an eight year project. Like that I'm going to be doing here. Um, yeah am I up for an eight year project? Cause I hate getting into a podcast and then it stops before it's finished. I'm listening to a lost one and they've done two episodes in two years now. Um, 
and it, it upsets me because it's a watch along. So, yeah. <laughs> my, so it's like, I wonder how Lost ends. But obviously, I know how Lost ends. It's brilliant, isn't it? Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's just that. Like, there was a little niche that wasn't being scratched, or you know, someone was doing it. I wanted it, and I had to jump yeah. in before someone else did it. Um, but yeah, so I did that. Great. And I was in, I had all this list of my favorite bands. And as I say, I'm obsessed with music. So it was like, right, who was I listening to when I was young? Who am I listening to now? And who's up and coming? And I wanted to do a nice mix of that sort of thing. And I've got quite eclectic taste. So some episodes will feature these. Um, but then, unfortunately, when I was speaking to people, they didn't want to talk about whatever that year was. They wanted to talk about their favorite film. So I was just like, right, okay, if you want to talk about the thing, uh, that was the Melvins guy, but I've already done 1982, then I'm going to just do a separate thing. So that's what we yeah. do. And sometimes, yeah, you're right. They don't talk about the movie at all. I just want to know about their band. Um, yeah. Um, and then we'll just mention the movie offhand. Yeah. But yeah, it's the best fun. I'm still enjoying it. I, I, and thank God I am because it's like, as I say, I've still got four years of this to to go before it yeah. comes to an well, end. I, the thing is, uh, as well, is I think where you where you win as well, like you know, getting Dave Lombardo, etc., is, um, and and I've learned this by pitching my podcast as um, as like, I you know, I've done stand up for twenty five years, singing a band, blah blah blah. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk to your artist about the new album. I want to talk to them about their life as a musician about their other interests about i want to interview the person not necessarily the musician you know i want to I, yeah. ideally all of my interviews with band members would be 10 minutes about a new, the latest release and then it would be an hour on other shit that they haven't talked about anywhere else because th that's that's what you come to me for do you know what I mean? That's what yeah. people are going to search out my podcast for is like, well, I didn't know James Murphy had a, a a brain tumor and, and like, that's why he got kicked out of a load of bands. It's like, wow. It's like, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff, but I, you've got that angle where it's like, yeah, I want to talk to your musician about not music. Yeah. They, they love that or yeah, hate it. Massively. Yeah, it well, as I mentioned to you, I was talking to Julie Weir at Music for Nations at Sony. Um, that episode's not out yet, folks. Don't worry. It's coming. And, um, and by the way, she was gutted that OMS had split. Wow. Um, and she was like, you know, great band. Really like them. Um, but straight away, now, she was saying that, like, the PR department, it, it's not like, you know, right, you know, get that website, get that website of the genres that they're in, get them to do an interview there, blah, 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 blah. It's like now, no, 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 no. Now it is cross media, cross cultures, cross genres. It's like, right, uh, what are the band members into? Are any of them into fishing? Are any of them into gardening? Are any of them into cooking? Are any of them into skateboarding? Are any of them into skiing? What podcasts, what interviews, what websites can we get that have got nothing to do with music? Yeah. Because you need to get to people any way you can. So, right. I'm, so I'm sure you're getting approached all the time now. Well, maybe all the time, not from musicians, though. It's like with actors. Um, I, I don't know how it's happened. I just guess naturally over the years, like the PR companies where there's new movies come out, they will send me, do you want to go to this premiere as, as we went to one? Um, or they were like, do you want to interview this up and coming star or this person that was in this film and then they're in this film. Yeah. And I get a lot of that with artists. It's me chasing. I did this real shitty thing. Whereas I wanted to interview ghost, um, yeah. the band ghost. Um, uh, by and, the way, you mean the good band, not the not the, not no, the fake an, merciful fate band. No, the fake the fake merciful fate band. Right, okay. that's who I wanted to interview. Right, um, uh, because Daniel loves them so much, and I just wanted to rub his face in it. Right, yeah, good idea. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also love this other band called 
ghost, but I think most people will pronounce them ghost, um, yeah. which is like a, a electronic y sort of thumping electronic band. But anyway, so like, but to do ghost with that PR, I had to, I felt like I had to interview other smaller bands that they deal with before oh, I could work my right. way up. Okay. Yeah. But I wasn't into those bands. And you could tell when you listen back on those interviews, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, oh, you want to talk? Oh, okay, whatever. And I just didn't feel like I was doing the right thing. And it's the one time I just felt like you sell out. You don't even really want to speak to Ghost. And yet you're jumping through all these hoops. Uh, so now I'm just sticking with, I will chase up the the band either through management or directly or however I, I can do it. Um, I don't get offered them unless it's a manager I've already dealt with. And then they send me like, what about this guy? Uh, what about this woman? You know? So yeah. Yeah. But with actors just all the time, every day I get an email. Uh, yeah. It's great. What a position to be in. That, but that is awesome. That is awesome. And, you know, the fact that you've managed to get there after all this, yeah, well, not after all this time, but a relatively short time, um, I think that's just, you know, it's awesome. It really is. Yeah, man. Love it. Um, it's, uh, and the, but the whole, the whole world, and, and again, I recognise that thought pattern as well, where you're like, right, there's, there's nothing out there that, that appeals to me there's nothing out there that you know that's covering each year there's nothing out there that's filling in the gaps in my horror knowledge in my horror knowledge you know mm. and i absolutely get that i listened to podcasts for 10 years before i started doing a podcast and then i was very clear about what i wanted to do and the kind of interviews that i wanted to get and how i wanted it to sound and take shape and and everything else and it's 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 that principle of well, because a lot, I think what stops a lot of people is they have that idea. And this is why you can't copyright an idea. They have that idea and then they do nothing about it because they don't want to follow through because they don't want to risk or they fear rejection. Whereas there's the other kind of person. And I think this is like, you know, as a performer, you have to have this attitude, which is if that, if that, if I want to hear that, then there's other people out there who are going to want to hear it. And there is enough people out there like me that are going to want to hear that to make it worthwhile. So I'm going to crack on at this like it's already a success. I'm going to put this out like this is, you know, this is obviously something someone should have been doing and now I'm doing it. Yeah. 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 You've got to have that, but you've got to have that kind of view, haven't you? You've got to have that kind of, Yeah. I'm all in. Let's do this. Yeah, it's it's come a long way from thinking back when I when I was like in my very early twenties, and I was discovering hardcore, and I was so invested in the keep it local, keep it small, keep it DIY, keep it true. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I don't know wh how I was thinking like that. I just don't see the point of that anymore. I can't even put myself in that position uh, anymore. And like, as I mentioned, like right at the beginning, like ego uh, has to have a lot to do with it, but I'm just like, and I, I don't suffer from anything like ADHD or anything like that, where I just need to make sure that I would complete this from the beginning to the end or else something will fuck up in my brain. Nothing like that. It's just that, I I've started just like with um like the promises with bands that I manage, like I will get you to a certain point. Then off you go. If you're at that point, you'll be able to find anyone you want. Like I'll get you there. And like I did, I managed four bands and got two to that point. That's I'd say a real big success. You know, that's 50%, great. That's a hell of yeah, a strike. Right? Mate, I'd take that. Um, I, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, well, on Patreon. So what I'm going to say is this. I want to just ask yeah. you a question. Um, Because as soon as you mentioned something like this earlier on, it really got me thinking. So like with regards to ohms, yeah, I'd say we peaked uh, and then have dipped down and then we just stayed pretty straight. Um, With talking bollocks, mentally, I would say you must have peaked with Suzanne Vega and Jason Newstead, like 
two of well, your Jason Newstead was the motorcast. Fair enough, fair enough. But I see it all as one Howard thing. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, well, talking bollocks, you're close. It, it peaked with probably opening one year. It was like Max Cavallera, Fish from Marillion, Suzanne Vega. Right. Come on, how do you how do you focus? Like, or, or now, where do you go from there? Now you've actually hit those big ones that you wanted to do. Um, I, I guess it's I never set out with an agenda of I want to speak to this person or I want to speak to that person. That never entered my mind. All I'm all I'm interested in is good interviews. Um, I've just done one with, um, well, latest episode of Talking Bollocks as we speak, as we're recording this, is um, Kyle from Exorder, which was really good fun to do. Um, and there's another one coming up with Dave from Mortar Scold, which I didn't even know of Mortar Scold. I got sent a new album, re really liked it. Um, within five minutes, Dave's going, what, the acid rain? Fuck, that's amazing. You listen, used to listen to your two, your first two albums all all the time before I was in a death metal band. I was in a crossover band. Oh, we lit. Fuck me. Really? Is this you? And I'm just like, I'm laughing my ass off. <laughs> um, and we honest, we had a we had a great chat. I kind of don't care who I'm talking to. It's like it's all about the interview. I always think like, you know, I can't wait for this one to come out. Um, Zolly from Ectomorph, which I, which I, was an interview I loved doing, which is the longest interview I think I've ever done, which is over 90 minutes. And we got into all sorts about, about loss and grief. Um, you know, he, he lost his mum. Um, and whilst talking to him, you know, you've, you've got to be able to go down that road with him. So I found mm. myself talking, I found myself talking about my father's passing, which I haven't talked about for a long time. He was, it's about 17 years ago since he died, but I recognized things that he'd said and it, it provoked emotions within me right. that, that, you know, it was, I mean, essentially, if you listen to that interview, it's two people basically in counseling with each other. Um, that, that is what's important to me. That that interview with Zolly is one of my favorite favorite I've ever done. My favorite interview, and will always be my favorite interview, is with the singer from Channel Zero in Belgium. Because, right. well, you know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, long story short, guys, um, I knew a guy from Belgium, uh, first two trips over to Belgium with Acid Rain, great friend, pen pals. And one day I got a letter saying, by the time you read this, I'll have, I'll have killed myself. And he had. And in that final letter to me, he said, I hope you and I wish I could remember his name. But let's say Danny. I hope you and Danny um, are able to do something together someday because he's a really cool guy. And that and and you know and so are you and that'd be great. And that guy was a singer in a band called Sixty Nine at the time, and he went on to be the singer in Channel Zero, who are like Belgium's equivalent of Metallica. Basically, they're fucking massive. And I got to chat to to him, and I basically read him the letter. All right. Um. Jeez. He and that took him back to a place where he was one of the people that was on the scene not long after he'd, he'd been discovered, he'd hung himself. Yeah. Um, and it was just, yeah, that's just insane because here was a letter that I had from like 1989 and here we were talking 20 odd years ago, finally working together and honoring the memory of a friend that we both had that passed away. Um, that will always be my favourite interview with the singer from Channel Zero, whose name I can't remember, which is terrible. Yeah. I feel bad about that. But so that's it's it's, it's ne there's never been there's never been that agenda. If someone said to me, and they have, you know, who's the interview you'd love to do the most? It's Mark. It's Marcelo Bielsa, former Leeds United manager, um, who doesn't do. I remember interviews. you saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who doesn't do interviews? So. You know, there you go. So I, I, I'd much rather interview somebody that's going to be a good interview than somebody I'm necessarily a fan of. Yeah. You know, but there have been amazing moments 
that have made me go like, what? Like when I'm saying to Justin Sullivan of New Model Army, who says he hasn't, like he hasn't seen like the Cav the Cavalleras for years, and I'm saying to him, oh, do you want Igor's mobile number? Because I've got it. And he's like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. And I'm sat there going, this is mental. Or when I'm chatting to Suzanne <laughs> Vega, and I mentioned that R Fish said to me, you know, I'm a writer, not a singer. I'm a singer. I'm a writer who can sing, not a singer who can write. And she was like, oh, yeah, no, I get that. Oh, and by the way, would you like to hear about him? Would you like to hear the story about that night? Me, me and Fish got drunk in a hotel. I was like, ah, yeah, all right. <laughs> I mean, they are awesome moments, but yeah. I don't hunt them. I don't chase them. Yeah, they just, just happened. Yeah, yeah. Somebody organized the, the Fish interview for me. Um, I was followed up on the Max interview. Um and um, I got the Jason one through a mutual contact. I got that for the motorcast. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a yeah, I don't have a target list. I don't have a list of ambitions. Um, I just want to create. I just want to keep creating compelling episodes. I want every episode to be as good as the last, if not better. You know, cool. And that's nice. That's that that and and ten years in, I can't believe that I'm still. I'm still functioning on that principle. Yeah, that's good. I don't, th I don't know if that's why I do it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I just want to like, there's this box of people that I, I you know, I just want to tick off. Yeah. I really want to speak to them. Done it. They were really boring, but I don't care. Like, I've spoken to them, you know, but that's cool as hell. I mean, sh surely Stephen King has got to be top of your list. Oh, again, or is he I, not I, a very good interview? No, he's a fantastic interview, but impossible. An, an impossible yeah. interview yeah. like the, yeah. the ones that i just don't i don't think i would ever get i don't even bother putting on there it's like why why would you like yeah yeah i, like, I know what you mean be because i think to, to sort of contradict myself one person i would like to get on the podcast and i've tried a couple of times and i have a contact and every version of my approach has been a no is is d schneider um I I I I, I mean, just think he's yeah. You would you, I, you wouldn't get a word in. He's a ledge. He's an absolute legend, and I would I'd love to get him. I would love to get Dee Schneider on the show more more than more than anything else. And I'll tell you what, it irks me to my very core that that Twisted Sister get referred to as a hair metal band, you know, or or or, or like a like one hit wonders. It really annoys me because I, I, I mean, they're still after all these years and some of the bands I've seen and some of the fucking amazing nights still top five. Twisted Sister, Manchester Apollo, come out and play to. You know, uh, and oh, you know, man, it, uh, people, that would have been good. It was awesome, mate. I mean, people like him, Ronnie Dio and Fish had a big influence on me as a young vocalist on his way, you know, vocalist, lyricist, front man on his way up. It's just like with Ronnie Dio, it was like, yeah, he's small, but fuck me. He's, he occupies that stage with his presence with fish. It was yeah. like, wow, what a raconteur between songs. And with D Schneider, it was like, he fucking tells you to do something. You fucking do it. Yeah. That's how that's how you I rule know a crowd. Yeah. That's how you rule a crowd like a fucking emperor, you know? And um I, I'll never forget. Um, he was doing a call and response thing with the crowd. Oh, and hang he just on, goes, hang and on. he just goes, Oh, hang on. Mr. Thanks. Puggles. Oh, dogs. Enough. Enough. Unbelievable. Can you hear that? I'm sorry. No, sorry to interrupt you. Not at all. Don't oh, worry, right, mate. In that case. Um, yeah, I just remember Dee Schneider just saying, like, we're doing this call and response for the crowd. And he just goes, right, lighting guys, switch off all the lights, house lights, house lights only. So the band are playing along, right? And now the house lights are on. And the straight away, everybody in the crowd starts looking at each other. Because you're now no longer in the darkness and the anonymity of being in an audience. You are now lit up. Everyone can see each other. Oh, all right. And everyone's smiling at each other like, this is a bit mad, isn't it? And Dee Schneider's just stood there and the band are like, you know, just playing quietly. And he's going, right, now 
It's just you and us. No bullshit, no stage, no lights. We can all see each other. So the focus is as much on you as it is on us. So you've got to give me everything. And I just thought, fuck me, this guy's good. You know, this is a this is a this is a fucking band that you know are absolutely killing it. And it's the one and only time I've ever seen Twisted Sister. And um, yeah, left a big impression on me. And the fact that also D. Schneider was the man who went to um, the hearings at the U.S. Senate and spoke up for rock and metal. Yeah. Um, just like, yeah, absolute ledge. And then throw in Jello Biafra as another reference. But, you know, there you go. That's 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 a good day. Do both of them in one day and then then you'll be like, oh, oh right, mate. <laughs> well, look, you, you, you've kind of you, you, you interviewed me for a second. So let's get back to you. Um, do you do you envisage have, have you started cooking up an idea of, right, well, this is what's going to follow up on a year in horror? Or are you thinking that there's already some spokes coming out that you can go further down or? Um, that's a good question because like, no, I haven't. Like I, my next thought is about just retiring and consuming <laughs> art and like moving to Wales and just going to be an old man and like do gardening. I'm really into that idea. I think it's right. about 15 years away, maybe. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, until then, I'm, I just want to keep keep on doing this until like something will change in my head. I'm not a very um, flitty person, like at, at all. Like if I want to do something, I'll I'll stick with it and do it as, if yeah. I'm able to do it, which I'm doing. But yeah, my next thought is, man, I'd just love to have a cottage in Wales and walk dogs. <laughs> Do you know what? I can't think of a more fitting place to leave this this conversation. That's a that's a it's a beautiful image for all of our uh, all of our listeners and patrons to take away. Um, so if you're listening to the edited version of this, um, that's the regular podcast. If you're listening to the full all of the bollocks that we've been talking, that's what you get when you sign up to Patreon. So well done for that. Um, uh, Paul's Patreon is a year in horror. So it's patreon.com forward slash a year in horror. Mine's patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. And um, Paul, it's been a pleasure, mate. I love you. Oh, love you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm